Welcome. I'm Bill Wake. This is my summary of my work on Twitch. Actually, it was two weeks ago. I was out of town last week, but we're working on a project called Tenth, which is an interpreter for a language similar to Fourth, but a bit smaller. Last week, we focused on implementing printNum so we can print numeric values. We implemented the if-else control structure by implementing two methods for if true and jump. And we started working on secondaries, calling secondaries. It doesn't work, but I think I know why. Print num prints a number that's held in x0 as a decimal. Because it's calling another routine, it's got to do a prolog where it stores the link register on the stack. It calls decimal to string, then it calls print with the result, and then the epilogue where it restores the link register and returns. So there's not much to the routine. It stores the data down there in L Dexter deck deck to string out. You can't reuse that. Uh, you, you need to use it up before you call this routine again. The next thing we tackled was if and else. So an if statement, in our language, it looks like there's there's a value A that you've, you've somehow pushed on the stack, followed by if, followed by some code, and end. And then the ways to get it encoded is whatever calculations you need to calculate A, and then an if true word, followed by a label reference, and then followed by the code that belongs inside the if, and then finally the end label. And so this if true method is going to test the value a. If it's if it's true, it's going to call, call the code inside the if. If it's false, it branches to the label and it skips the if. Now an if else statement is similar, but it has to do a little more jumping around. So the first part's the same. It starts off evaluating a, and then if true. But instead of jumping to the end, it, it jumps to the else label, which is the code following the else. Then you have the code inside the if. So again, executed if the if is true. And then uh, at the end of the if, it jumps around the else clause to out to end label. And then followed by else label and its code and end label and the code after the if statement. So there's a little dancing around between, between how you jump. But it, it fits the model of of an if-then-else executing either one or the other. Let's look at jump first. So the, the secondary coming in is on the left there. You've got some code followed by jump, followed by a label, and then some more code and eventually the label. And x20 is our virtual program counter. And by the time you get into the method, it's pointing at that end label. So the code for jump then is really just load the contents of that label into the virtual program counter and that that affects a jump. We still return because we're not manipulating the PC, the system level PC, we're uh, manipulating our virtual one. Um, the LDR X20, X20 is the result. So it's really like virtual program counter equals the contents of that label. If true is a little more complicated. So the setup coming in is you've got a data stack with A, B, C, et cetera on the stack, whatever values those are. A is there ready to evaluate. And then we have our secondary, and the program counter is pointing to the word just after the if true, and followed by a next word, and, and down later is a false label. So the code for this then, on the right, we pop data x0, that gets the A value into x0, and we compare that to zero. Then we skip if it's zero, okay? So if it's true that it's zero, that's really the false case. So we'd skip down to L skip if. If it's not zero, then it's true, and we continue with the add x20, x20 plus eight. So remember, x20 is the virtual PC, so in effect, we're moving to the next word, eight, eight bytes, because it's a 64-bit system. So uh, that add moves us to the next word, and we continue execution by um, jumping to end if true, which is, is just our return. The other case was we, we jumped, um, down to else skip if because it was false. And then just like our jump command, load x20 with the contents of x20 is really the, the unconditional jump at that point because we've already tested the condition. So we know we want to jump. And in effect, it jumps us down to false label. So uh, in this case, we've fallen through to next word if the condition was true. And if it was false, we jump down to false label. It's It's a little mind-bending at some point, and I might work on those label names, but um, it it uh, it's 
really does encode how if is intended to work. So I'm, I'm very happy to have these done. We need some control structures if we're going to do recursion and any work really. All right. And then our last one was uh, kind of the painful one. We're trying to get secondaries calling secondaries. So remember the secondary is a, a list of, of things, a list of procedures to call. All right. So building this up, requires a lot of setup, which is kind of painful and uh, uh, easy to get wrong, but I think we're getting there. Okay, so this, the first blocks there, load address x0 gets start 2d, x1 gets start 2d header. Basically, we're, we're loading on the left that start 2d header, we're, we're going to get the address of the start 2d routine. And similarly for push header and end header. So the primaries, our assembly language code, have a header, and this is, this is where that's going to be. We're not actually keeping the header next to the code because uh, our assembler doesn't let us load relocatable addresses into data sections. So we have to do it at runtime. Once we have those addresses, we can build a dictionary, which is its, uh, which is sort of the implementation of uh, how do you how do you keep references to all these all these functions. Uh, we've got some macros. They tell us we're going to load up test dictionary with. Zero, slot zero is star two D header. Slot one is push header. Slot two is secondary two, um, the secondary we're defining, and then slot three is n two D header. So um, those are in the dictionary now, and then we create our two secondaries. So the secondary start uh, L secondary one is going to be the secondary we fill in using the test dictionary, and um, the it's a list of a list of entries in the dictionary. So the first slot is zero, which is start 2D. Then we call secondary two with two and n2D with three. That's it for secondary one. And then we define secondary two. It's uh, It starts with start 2D, it calls push. It's followed by a data word, which is 55. And it ends with call to n2D. So our hope is that you, if you start secondary one, you're gonna enter it you're going to call uh, secondary two, and you're gonna you're gonna exit with n2d, and secondary two is just gonna push some data on the stack. We're gonna take that, and we're loading the x0 gets the address of the secondary and calling run interpreter, which is gonna delegate into the routine that corresponds to uh, the start 2d that corresponds to secondary one. I'm not 100% sure that's the where we wanna start the interpreter, but that's where we are working now. And then uh, at the end, we're going to get the address of the data stack, load the contents, which is the, the word that's in the stack, and then compare, uh, that's an x0, and then x1 gets the 55 we expect, and we'll do a call to assert equal to make sure they're actually the right ones. Okay, so far, it's not been right, and I think I know why, but I do have some critique on this. The first is these load addresses, they really should be a macro. It's it's a very fixed pattern and we can conceptually say, you know, it's it's really like load header or something like that. And um, that will make it a little simpler to, to make sense of what's going on. This is still somewhat complicated to understand, but it's a lot less complicated than before we had the macros. Okay, now I think I know the problem though. I think our secondary address should not be the index in the dictionary. I think it should reference that label directly. So um, I need a new macro that says, give me a label, I think. And then um, we don't need it in the dictionary because basically the dictionary is gonna be for the primaries, not for secondaries. Um, in the long run, there will be secondaries in a dictionary, but not in this structure. So I don't know. I've got a vision for where it should go, but definitely here. I think this is. I think this is the problem. The testing we were doing, it looked like it, we needed to do an extra level of indirection, and I think that's because I had the address of the address of the address rather than the address of the address or something like that. You know, one one level too far in the pointers. This coming week, we're going to get this secondaries calling secondaries working. I hope my insight is a valid one. As so often happens, it's something I realized in the shower the next morning, like, wait, I think I know what's going on. Okay, but anyway, I hope we get those working this week. Once we have the secondaries working, we can make a test of recursion, which will check and make sure that we're 
properly pushing and popping to make sure the the virtual PC acts like a real PC, as, as a real PC would when it calls routines and things like that. Okay, and then once we have those in place, I think we're ready to start just building out primary methods. So we know we need some words to, to do stack stuff. We need some arithmetic. We need, uh, well, we'd like to have a while loop as well as uh, an if statement and a, and a repeat until probably whatever control structures I feel like are, are critical. Um, yeah. Once we have those, I think we've we've got the basics of our language, um, the the interpreter control of it. I, I'm not quite sure where to lead to next. One, One possibility would be build up the dictionary structure and make our our setup more realistic and then move on to making words compile and a little bit of a runtime control. The second could be we could we could try and focus more on the primary methods, build things in our new language and see how that goes. I kind of think maybe getting the the structure ready and compiling it would speed us up on the other. So we'll probably go that way. I'd love to have you join us sometime. We meet Monday through Thursday, 2 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time or 7 to 9.30 p.m. UTC. You can come join us at xp123.com slash twitch for the live sessions, or you can go to xp123.com slash YouTube and get the old sessions uh, time delayed by, I think, about two to three weeks at this point and lightly edited. All right, take care. Bye-bye.